my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving sees, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God. Welcome to worship today. This is worship for Sunday, May 16th, 2021 at New Hope Lutheran Church in Agora Hills, California. This is the seventh and the last Sunday in the season of Easter. So just this one last time for this year, we use our Easter greeting and we say, Christ is risen. And the answer is, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. In these seven weeks since Easter, we've been looking for signs of the risen Christ in the characters of the earliest church movement. We've looked at Thomas and Peter, Philip and Cornelius and others. And today we're invited to see ourselves as ones for whom the spirit of the risen Christ longs to meet, encounter, to yearns to love us into healing and call us into life-giving service. He is risen. And so we too arise. Our kids are a special part of our church, and so we want to welcome them this morning and invite them to come near for a message that's designed especially for them from our own Pastor Scott Fielder. So we say good morning, Pastor Scott. Hey everyone, it's Pastor Scott Fielder, and you know what that means. It's that time in New Hope service for our children's message. So if we've got any young people listening, please come close and make sure that you can hear because this message is especially for you, but of course it is for everyone. Uh, I want you to try and guess what the next thing that I'm going to say is. Okay, so if I said one, two, three, then you would say four. That's right. Uh, what about... Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? That's the next, right, you guys are good at this, right? So when we uh, talk about something like that where you can kind of anticipate what's coming next or you kind of know because it's 
you know, sort of this established order. The fancy word for that is called a sequence. You know, it's just kind of the order in, uh, you know, in which um, some things just go, whether it's the days of the week or uh, the numbers that we count. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about a sequence is because we uh, see Jesus talking to his disciples about prayer. And there's a particular sequence that we see uh, that we are also still called to to this day. And the sequence is that Jesus gets words from God, and then Jesus gives those words to his disciples, and then the disciples' job is to spread that to everyone. That's kind of the sequence, and that has been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years because after those disciples, you know, weren't around anymore, then there were more disciples because they had gone through that sequence and they had passed on the words of Jesus, you know, to the next disciples, you know, to the next generation of people. And that's why we still have churches today. That's why we still gather for worship today and we read the Bible and we, you know, practice Jesus' teachings and uh, all those great things. Um, but of course, if we want to sort of keep this tradition and keep this sequence going, it is part of our, you know, duty as Christians and part of our faith life to continue to share those words. And so that's why we go to church every week. And we, you know, even though sometimes it feels like it's repetitive, it's so that we can know, you know, scripture and know Jesus and God well enough that we can pass that along to other people. And you're going to hear, you know, words and callings from God in your life in different ways. And then it's going to be our jobs when we hear that to do something that's called proclaiming. And that's kind of like if you were just telling a lot of people, you know, one thing, that's something that we are called to as Christians, to proclaim the love of God that God has for us because of Jesus and his life and his sacrifice. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much that in life we have this sequence that we can rely on. We know that you are going to be present, that you are going to love us, and that is something that we are called to share and do for one another. And may we continue that sequence, continue that tradition of love in your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. In the season of Easter, we've been bringing back the Kyrie, the prayer where we ask for God's mercy. And so today, with the seventh Sunday, we invite you into the Kyrie. In this Easter season, your Easter people bring our hearts to you, pleading for mercy for ourselves and for our world. For the beauty, responsibility, and renewal of creation, make us stewards, we cry. For your church throughout the world, celebrating the ascension of Jesus, even as we cannot help but look on earthly things, Keep us focused instead on your Son, we pray. Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. For the society, but also the church, still separated by virus and vaccination. For those eager to return, for those who are hesitant, for leaders who plan for uncertain times, encourage us, we pray. Christe eleison, Christ, have mercy. For the students, celebrating milestones for graduations held virtually or creatively together and for students, teachers, and parents still mourning the losses of the last 15 months. Grant us peace, we plead. Curie eleison. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, O Lord, and hear these pleas for mercy for us and for our world. Your church that prays Kyrie eleison is also a church that pleads Maranatha. Lord, come. And you do. Crucified and risen, you awaken us from death to life, injustice to truth, confusion to faith, inaction to compassion. Therefore, most glorious and risen Savior, we raise our song of praise. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your God, glory to God in the highest. 
Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seen at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people on earth. For you alone are the Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Christ you protect us from evil. By your Spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading comes from Acts Chapter 1, beginning with the 15th verse. In those days, Peter stood among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for this seventh Sunday in the season of Easter is taken from the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. Jesus prayed, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They are yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, 
and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in the truth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We Americans have a love affair with winners. Successful undertakings of nearly every sort receive the admiration of those around us. As a group, we delight in the, in the banquets and the ceremonies and the honors that we can pile upon those who are successful. People who come in second, which is the graphic for today, are just rarely remembered, hardly ever celebrated in our culture. The runner-up usually receives a brief word of recognition and then is quickly forgotten. If you happen to be a sports enthusiast, you'll remember the successful franchise, but not the ones who came in second place or the ones who lost in the playoffs. In fact, we only remember the second place or the honorable mention when they're famous for losing, like the Cubs, even though they themselves beat their alleged curse. All you need to do is do a simple search in an online bookstore or stop by any bookstore and you'll see how many books there are about winning, about success, about coming in first place. Consider then this man, Joseph Barsabbas, who along with a guy named Matthias was the finalist for the inclusion in the other 11 disciples. He was going to become one of the 12 apostles. Luke tells us that there were about 120 people present when the choice was made and announced. You know, some Bible stories leave out the details and we wonder what's happening from time to time. It seems likely that everyone knew that Bersabbas, Joseph Bersabbas, Justice, he has all kinds of names, maybe that's why he didn't win. Bersabbas, he might receive the open slot and, and take his place among the 12. He probably had folks cheering him on. And it takes immense strength of moral character to give a word of congratulations when the winner is announced and it's not you. It's someone else. No one likes to lose. We don't learn any more about Joseph Barsabbas, nor do we learn any more about Matthias. Presumably, he was a fine person, even considered honorable to be eligible to be a disciple and apostle. He had accompanied Jesus from the time of the baptism all the way through resurrection appearances. But Joseph Barsabbas came in second. There must have been a twinge of sadness, you'd think, or disappointment. Maybe our lesser angels of our nature would have some anger or even jealousy, perhaps. Or perhaps he was relieved not to have that responsibility. One thing becomes clear, though, in the New Testament, that the disciples are imperfect people just like the rest of us. I mean, let's look at Peter, whose courage failed him in Gethsemane, Thomas, who's unsure, James and John, who are nicknamed sons of thunder, um, maybe because they spoke out of turn. Remember the time when they were vying for positions of power when Jesus came to reign in his kingdom? Like you and me, those people also had to struggle with sin and had to struggle with self-centeredness. One must feel a moment of sympathy for Joseph Barsabbas, though, when he realized how close he had come to becoming one of the inner circle, one of the 12 apostles, but he didn't come in first. Some folks, like we do at our house, like to watch The Voice, a televised singing competition, and wow, those contestants have amazing voices, don't they? 
You notice they don't spend much time on those who don't qualify or those who lose in the lightning round or lose out in the vote. I'm, I'm sure, though, if you actually went backstage, there is lots of strong emotions being expressed. Second place? Second place can hurt, and it can hurt a lot. What does the Bible have to say about it? Does it offer consolation to us when we fall short? Of course it does. I suspect if Jesus were to give us any advice on this, to speak directly to us about our success-orientated generation, it would be that he would tell us to press on in our efforts to be successful, provided that we do so in ways that are ethical, compassionate toward others, caring for creation, loving God and loving others, while keeping a appropriate amount of self-love too. I imagine Jesus reminding us that, you know, success or failure is really not the ultimate thing. That's really not what he's looking for. We know God can, has, and does use both success and failure to bring about God's purposes in the world. It's not the greatness of the work that God is often looking for. It's the greatness of the heart inclined toward God to serve others, even in the littlest things. Martin Luther wrote, What you do in your house is worth as much as if you did it up in heaven for our Lord God. And he went on to talk about a milkmaid. A milkmaid can do her tasks to the glory of God. St. Paul wrote, Whatever your task, put yourself in it as if it's done for the Lord. You might recall the calling of David to be king. He was the, kind of the runt of the litter in Samuel 16. It reminds us that God does not look at life or at human beings or importance the way human beings do. A news report uh, out of Washington State told the story of two little boys, Francisco and Fernando Soto. They were aged four and eight. They were playing by a swimming pool in the Carlton Place apartments in Bellevue, Washington, while little Francisco fell into nine feet of water of that pool. His little brother, four, jumped in to save him. The problem was neither of them could swim. Their mother, who also couldn't swim, began to scream as she watched her two children struggle beneath the waves. So it happened that a 49-year-old Jorge Pagan, a maintenance worker from Puerto Rico, had just returned from a run that day and was sitting out in the cool air of his balcony when he heard the cries for help. Knowing seconds would make the difference in a drowning, Jorge jumped from his balcony to the ground and raced to the, to the pool only to find a, of course, a wall, a, a fence barrier between him and the, the, the drowning children. Heedless of injury, he slammed into that wooden fence with such force to knock a hole through it big enough for him to get through. He leaped into the water and dragged the gasping two little boys to safety. Jorge Pagan suffered injuries which required medical treatment. But he'd saved two little boys. Pagan had been a boxer. But winning no titles, he decided he'd try something else. So he was studying and teaching martial arts, but also he won no titles. Perhaps the world had taken little attention to Jorge through the years, but though he may not have won any of the titles in those things that he was trying to achieve at, there were no worldly honors. We would agree that that day, and for that mother, every day after that, Jorge was number one in the game of life. I believe Jesus might very well point to something like this as an example of success that's valued in heaven. Perhaps in the short run, it's not much consolation when we've tried so hard to be successful in this life. But the Bible takes the long view of these on our disappointments. Failure and disappointment, they are part of life. And if I'm honest, think about this, my spiritual life grows kind of shallow as things go too well. It's when disappointment or hardship of one kind or another marks my life that I find myself turning again to my friend Jesus for encouragement and for help. And remarkably, the encouragement always seems to be there. And the word always seems to come through. Something like, quit thinking so much about yourself. Think of the other person. Be a winner in the deepest part of your soul and you can't lose in any way that truly matters. Just be faithful to what you know is right. That's often kind of the message that I hear. And I'm often caught up, I think probably like most of us, in wanting to be important or significant in some way to something or, or to someone. But it may surprise us that the most important and valuable moments to God 
don't look like that. Perhaps the most important moment happening on the planet at this moment to God, the snapshot that God is looking at, is some little boy halfway around the world who doesn't have enough food himself, but is sharing his last piece of fruit with a woman who hasn't eaten that day. Perhaps of all the great things that are happening in the world today, of all the advancements, perhaps that's the one snapshot that God is holding precious. In God's book, maybe that's what greatness looks like. What snapshots of life change matter to God? That's what I want us to consider on this last Sunday in the season of Easter. Today, we conclude this series on snapshots of a life changed, and we're looking at the replacement of the last disciple. No, 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 we're not looking at the replacement. We're actually looking at the person who didn't get chosen to be the 12th apostle. His name, Justice, Joseph, Barsabbas, the guy who came in second place, but had a lifetime of experience living with Jesus during his earthly ministry. All those miracles, all those teachings, all those events, all those relationships enriched him. He encountered the risen Christ whose work for him set him apart. He didn't win the election. No book in the New Testament is named after Justice Joseph Barsabbas. Thank goodness. <laughs> in fact, we don't hear anything else about this guy from this moment on. He just disappears into obscurity. But he got Jesus. He got Jesus in the way you and I haven't yet gotten it. And if we're measuring eternity, he got absolutely everything he ever needed. More than he deserved, of course. More than what we have had in our lifetime of faithfulness to the risen Jesus. Barsabbas is a model for us of all disciples who never get our name in the paper. Who work faithfully to see the love of God and neighbor because, well... Jesus loved us first, so how could I do anything else? There's the snapshot. In Acts chapter 1, which we read today, Terry read for us today, the gospel takes on an organizational structure. The movement of Jesus takes on a shape. The freedom of the Spirit takes on a form, a form of life. And we call that life church, but what we mean by it is you and me gathered together in the name of Jesus, the body of Christ in the world. Win or lose, sinners or saints, in good times and in bad times, the movement of Jesus takes on a shape. The Spirit takes on a form of life in you, dear church. You. Remember then who you are and whose you are, as we heard about in our gospel. You're God's that you're hidden in him. And that one of the most important things we can ever have is that vital, vibrant relationship that we have through our risen Jesus and reflect it into the world, whether there come accolades or not, but to live for the audience of one who applauds us for eternity. A snapshot then of a life changed because it lived for, by, and in Jesus just like Joseph Barsabbas. And I pray, just like you. Amen. Praise the one who breaks the darkness with a liberating light. Praise the one who frees the prisoners Thank
alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer us in steadfast love. Let us pray. Mighty God, the world is your handiwork, displaying your creative impulse. Seas teem with life, forests reach up to praise you, and the mystery of life lies deep in the soil. Guard and keep this world for the well-being of all your creatures. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Gracious Sovereign, those who follow your ways are like trees planted near streams of water. Establish the leaders of the nations and all in authority in your grace and truth. Strengthen them so that the people they serve will find abundant life. Through leadership, inspired by you, O Lord, quell violence as experienced in our world today in places like Israel and Gaza and Nigeria. And tame our own divisiveness and demonizing. Grant and bless us with good leadership. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy God, in Christ Jesus, the joy of the church is made complete. Root the church in your word and unify us as Christ's body. Send us in the world as your loving people, ready to testify to your spirit at work. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Generous Savior, you befriend those who are suffering the poor, the lonely, the outcasts, the rejected, or the sick. Grant healing and love to all who are in need. Be with those who begin a new adventure, moving, from, moving to a new place like the Merrill family, the Green family, the Harrell family, the Burton family, the Gibbons and Tracy families. Give them tangible signs of your steadfast love in new places. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, here in this community we share the gift of praying, learning, and supporting one another. Give us thankful hearts as we claim the gifts that are unique to us and keep us from being envious of others with differing gifts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Saving God, your wonderful promise is the gift of eternal life in Jesus. Through the witness of those who have died in you, strengthen us now in the gift of life. We cherish the memory of of your saints and ours. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may our glorious God grant you the spirit of wisdom to know and to love our risen Jesus. The God of life, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen, and we say, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. And the church answers, thanks be to God. Alleluia. church is one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord she is his new creation by water and the word from him he came and sought her to be his holy bride with his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth, a charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy name she blesses,
church victorious shall be.